we have uh, Dr. Mike Ryan and Dr. Maria Van Kerkhove uh, time to answer your questions about COVID-19. Um, today, uh, we will focus on so-called lockdown measures uh, or strict restrictions that many countries are reintroducing at the moment as we are seeing the number of cases growing and number of people hospitalized is also, also growing. Uh, so please, if you're watching us on Twitter, um, use hashtag AskWHO to ask your questions. If you're watching us on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube or Twitch, uh, please uh, leave your questions via comments. Uh, section. Um, while we are waiting for our viewers uh, to, to send their questions, good afternoon, Mike, Maria. Thank you for your time and being with us here again. Um, as mentioned, the, the number of cases is still growing. We are seeing new records almost every day, and we see that number of people hospitalized uh, for sickness from COVID uh, is, is growing. Uh, so countries, in particular in Europe, but in other parts of the world, are reintroducing the uh, strict measures like so-called lockdowns. Um, can we explain as well what does it mean when we say so-called lockdowns because they are not the same in, in, in countries and um, what countries are actually trying to achieve with, the, with those restrictions? So yeah, hi Alex, thanks for having us again. Um, yeah, the word lockdown means different things to different um, people um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a word that many countries use but it can mean a combination of factors. Um, so in the, in the strictest of term, a lockdown would mean everything was closed. Everybody was home, everything was closed and, and literally quite shut down. And in fact, we've seen very few um, carry out what is a full lockdown. Um, what the lockdown, the so-called lockdowns are, include some closures or partial closures of certain businesses or restaurants, um, bars, gyms, cinemas um, for a temporary period of time. Um, in, in certain regions of a country, you know, where transmission is most intense, it can include um, stay-at-home orders um, in which uh, families are either asked to stay home or they are mandated to stay home. Um, some of it has to do, uh, some have used the curfews where they have to be home after 9 p.m. or 6 p.m. or something like that. Um, some of these so-called lockdowns include school closures although we're starting to see less and less school closures because everyone recognizes the extreme importance of having kids in school for so many different reasons. Um, so indeed what you highlight, uh, Alex, is that a number of countries right now um, are facing uh, increased growth in cases. Um, and you know, more worrisome is that we're seeing an acceleration of hospitalization rates and we're seeing some intensive care units filling to capacity in many cities across Europe. Uh, and that is quite worrying because as beds become full, um, there are no more beds for other people that will need them. Um, and the system becomes overwhelmed very, very quickly. So these uh, partial lockdowns or these restrictions that countries are putting in place are aimed to slow the spread uh, and aim to uh, restrict the ability for the virus to continue to transmit and take some pressure off of the system. Um, what we're seeing in a number of cities uh, and a number of areas across Europe um, is that countries are using the information they have about the virus, where it's spreading, how intense it's spreading, what are the capacities in those regions, and looking at what can they do to help the situation. And so there are a number of these restrictive measures that are being put in place here, even in where we live right now. Uh, we're seeing that, that done as well with closures of bars and restaurants, and, and, um, but schools are staying open. Mm -hmm. um, so I think uh, you know, this is, these are one of the measures that are, several of the measures that are being put in place to try to, to restrict, mm -hmm. to you limit transmission. You mentioned schools, and we already have a follow-up question from a viewer on LinkedIn. Um, when countries introduce those so-called lockdowns and, and measures, do schools need to be closed as well? So these are the decisions that the, the, those in leadership need to take in those regions because as we've talked a lot about schools, um, the decision to close a school or partial sc uh, uh, school closure or going to distance learning or online learning um, needs to be taken very carefully. Um, it matters how much transmission is in the area because the schools reside in the area where the communities are. So if the virus is circulating in the community, it can enter into the school. Um, what we're seeing is that uh, many areas are really prioritizing keeping schools open, especially for the youngest kids, 
uh, because of the developmental aspects, not only the education aspects, but the social and developmental aspects, security, and in many parts of the world, this is where children receive food. Um, so no, schools don't have to close. Um, and I think what we are hoping is that the other measures that are put in place can really keep these kids uh, safe. Um, I do want to say the use of lockdowns, or the so-called lockdowns, don't replace all of the other measures that have to continue to be in place. They do not replace the need for active case finding. They do not replace the need for cluster investigation, um, ample testing with quick turnaround, um, contact tracing. Um, all of that has to continue, building up your workforce to carry out these essential services that are really needed to bring transmission under control and care for the people who need care, not only for COVID-19, but for all of the other diseases that circulate and, and preventative measures that are, that are in place. Yes, <coughs> couldn't agree more, <coughs> Maria. Uh, just again, going back to the global situation, because <coughs> obviously the situation in Europe right now is quite a concern, but uh, that's not necessarily the full global picture. We've certainly seen much of the Northern Hemisphere and the Americas and in Europe go into a, 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 an increased transmission scenario. Um, but if you look at Southeast Asia, if we look at Africa, and we look at the Western Pacific areas, the disease is generally on the decline, but there have been some notable exceptions. So in the Western Pacific area, uh, which includes China and Korea and Japan, we've seen downward trends, but the Philippines and certainly Malaysia at the moment is experiencing an increase, particularly around the area in the Sabah area. Same in Africa, you're seeing a general downward trend, um, but you're seeing some countries starting to see an uptick in cases. And uh, I say that because it's really important. The situation Europe is in now and, and, and the Americas are in is very difficult, and it's going to be very hard to stop the disease using the traditional sort of containment measures of case finding and contact tracing and isolation and quarantine, because the, there's just so many cases. Um, and in, in that sense, uh, the so-called lockdowns or restrictive measures are being put in place in, in a sense to try and break the chains of transmission by separating everybody from everybody else. But that in itself won't stop transmission because people will go home and they live in multi-generational households and in some situations going home means you're going to be in an overcrowded situation. That's not the same in every circumstance. And we saw that in, in, in countries, particularly with migrant and other populations. Uh, they don't always live in the same conditions. In Singapore, when uh, people were staying at home, <clears throat> well, when migrants stayed at home in overcrowded dormitories, transmission was ignited in that situation. So we have to look at um, as, uh, the implications of, of, of lockdowns, and they are. They mean, lockdowns will shut down the disease, and it's been proven again and again. The problem is they shut down the economy, they shut down social life, and have previously shut down schools. The question is to find the minimum amount of lockdown you need to stop the virus and have the minimum impact on the um, on the economy and that's very difficult uh, to calculate uh, because it's very hard to know exactly so if you completely lock down the situation yes you can stop the virus transmission but there's that causes its its, its own damage so the most important thing now as countries go into this phase is to really put in place the other things that we need to have uh, like uh, testing and contact tracing and supported quarantine. We ask contacts to quarantine. Uh, it's, you know, go home, sit in my apartment. Who's going to feed me? Where am I going to get my food? Who's going to take care of my kids? Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot. When we say quarantine and self-isolate, they're easy words. They're hard to do. And in many situations, if we want, if you look at Asia and compare in general the experience in Asia, and we look at what Australia has done most recently, if you are going to go after this virus, you can use a lockdown to get push the virus down, and once you get the virus to low levels, you have got to go after the virus. And the only way you go after the virus is to find the people who are infected, they need to isolate, and the contacts need to quarantine. And both the ca cases and the contacts need to be supported in doing that. And we just have not built enough capacity and enough infrastructure and enough support to do that. And until we do that, We'll go through this phase, and then we'll go through the next phase, and the next phase. And the danger, and I've said this since, I think, March, the worst case scenario is to move from lockdown to lockdown. Not to move from wave to wave, but to move from lockdown to lockdown. We know the damage it does psychologically. We know the damage it's doing socioeconomically. 
But at the same time, when your hospitals are full and your intensive care units are full, there's nothing you can do. You have to take the pressure off the health system. Um, and that's why people end up being separated from other people. Um, it's very complex. It's very hard to criticize. People are saying, oh, governments shouldn't be locking down. But they're facing a very stark situation. Their emergency rooms are full in some cases. Their intensive care units are overflowing. They're moving patients between districts, sometimes now between countries. Um, and they have to do something to try and shut down the infection. Thank you very much. Can, can I quickly just Please. say that the, the, it is easy to criticize, but I think what we have to do is look at the situation that we're in right now. And I think the decisions that are being made are looking at the situation that they're in right now, the, not the situation they were in, you know, a few weeks ago. Um, you can think forward. You know, now is the time to think forward. And one of the things we really need to see is a scale up. So countries that are in the midst of increased transmission, increased hospitalization, increased ICU rates need to scale up. Um, the big difference between now and the spring is that all of these increases across Europe anyway are happening at the same time. We had a little bit of staggering in the spring. So there was this ability to support one another. We don't ha we're not in that situation again. Um, so there can be some movement, as, as Mike has said, with patients and with, with health workers, but the pressure is happening on many cities at the same time, and that makes things even harder. So we need scale up. We need more beds. We need more capacity. And one of the things we have recommended um, in the beginning, which we've learned, we learned from the experience in China, is uh, medical care or an isolation of even mild patients outside of the home so that the virus isn't brought into the home because a lot of transmission is happening in the home all over the world. Mm -hmm. But if people, cases, patients, people can be cared for outside of the home in either repurposed facilities um, that are fit to care for mild patients, patients who aren't expected to develop severe disease, so people who don't have underlying conditions, people who are not of advanced age, can be cared for and monitored outside of the home in these specially built facilities, that could also take a lot of pressure off of the hospitals, which can be primarily focused on individuals who need supportive care, who will uh, like more, be more likely to advance to severe disease. And so that approach of tailored um, care for mild patients outside of the home, for critically and severe patients, or individuals who are at risk for developing severe disease in hospitals, that can, uh, that can help uh, an overburdened medical system. So there's a lot of different ways um, that countries can, uh, can deal with this. But also the countries that are in low levels of transmission, we cannot emphasize enough to scale up now. Use this opportunity while transmission is low, and congratulations on all of the hard work of getting it low, to stay low. So that means make building your workforce, whether these are case uh, people who can help go out and help find cases and support cases to carry out uh, contact tracing and do cluster investigation. Build that workforce now. Build up your test capacity. Build up your workforce. Build up your hospitals. Because hopefully you won't have another upsurge in, in COVID-19. But you may. Uh, and then you'll be, you'll be even more ready for that. But having that system in place will be, better, will be beneficial for any infectious disease that will, that will cross borders. So I think um, the time now everywhere around the world is to scale up. Thank you very much, Maria. Mike, here is a question from our uh, viewer on Facebook, uh, Marianne El Soy. Mm -hmm. uh, how can countries learn better from each other so they can react before it's almost too late? It's a great question. Um, you know, one of the, the strengths um, that we have as an interconnected world is our ability uh, to share experiences. Um, we, as WHO, we do this a number of different ways. Um, where, first of all, we have through our regional offices, our six regional offices, there are many meetings that they have with, with the ministers across all of the, uh, the countries that are within each of those regions for, for knowledge exchange. Um, here in headquarters in Geneva, we have these member state briefings that we have once a week, um, and uh, sometimes more often than once a week, where we provide the opportunity for countries to share experiences with each other, say, this is the approach that we have taken. Um, they outline all of the steps that they have uh, put in place to deal with their first cases, to actively find cases, and how they've managed their control efforts as the pandemic unfolded in their country. And that practical experience of giving the first hand and, and see how they, they all use the same tools, 
but they may apply them slightly different ways. And that is really helpful to, to exchange uh, between countries. So we provide those opportunities to share. We also have a lot of our international networks where we have uh, public health professionals and clinicians and they're speaking on the phone to one another almost daily now. And there's an exchange of information that way as well. So a, a doctor uh, in one country um, in, in Asia is talking to doctors in Asia, or talking to doctors in Europe, or talking to doctors in South America, or talking to doctors in North America, and, and doc talking to doctors in North Africa and South Africa all over regularly. And that exchange of information is, is real-time exchange of information. And that's uh, very helpful um, to bounce ideas off of, to pose challenges, and to just say, well, how did you deal with this? How did you deal with this in your country? Uh, you have a similar capacity in your country than we do, um, and, and, and work through it together as a global community uh, tackling this virus. Thank you very much, Maria. Uh, people are, all, I mean, our viewers are asking as well, for how long do we think these restricted measures will need to be in place? Um, and also, you mentioned um, that after the lockdowns are lifted, we need to go after the, the virus that includes other, other tools and measures to put in place. But the LinkedIn viewer is asking, how could countries go uh, and get the, get the virus uh, and c cases down if people don't agree with masking and possibly physical distancing? That's the, that's the tough question, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. In, in terms of the length of lockdown, again, nothing in this is perfect science. Uh, and. The, the extent of the lockdown. You know, you've, we've heard all the controversies. People are saying, "Well, why the curfews? What, we, what the virus is a nighttime virus now?" You know, I mean, we've, you know, uh, and it's not that anyone thinks the, the the virus is a nighttime virus. I think many governments have decided <coughs> that it's uh, that it's uh, some of the behaviours that occurs late on when people have more alcohol. Are people come together, parties start, house parties happen. So what they're trying to do maybe is prevent some of the other types of gatherings that might occur. So they're trying to get everybody home, uh, get everyone in their houses and, and in a sense create that sort of avoid that scenario. It's not that they believe the virus spreads more at night. And sometimes we create these uh, false, uh, what they're trying to do is put together a series of measures that allows us to get maximum control on virus transmission and minimum impact on people's lives. And that means trade-offs all the time. <clears throat> there is no zero risk of transmission uh, almost in, 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 any, in any circumstance. We, we, there's a very interesting little video that the, the media people put out <clears throat> today, which is really about that idea of you know, you know, the duration, the, 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 the time you spend in a given place, and the different risks you take, and Maria can explain. But I think that ability to, uh, <clears throat> to be able to do that. So from the perspective of lockdowns, the, the, the disease takes about a, a less than a week to generate the next generation of cases. Now, not everyone's infected on the same day, but if you, if you think about this as a kind of a, a thought experiment, right? The virus infects, let's imagine the virus infected a bunch of people at the same time. On average, it takes about less than a week to generate the next generation of cases, and then about a week to generate the next generation after that. So when people are designing lockdowns, what they want to do is put the lockdown in place to cover a number of generations of transmission of the disease. So you get the best chance of stopping it. So you stop that amplification. So one case goes to two cases, goes to you know five cases, and that builds up. If you go the other direction and you put everyone back in their houses, over a period of weeks, you'll shut down to a great extent that transmission. Unfortunately, you don't stop the transmission in the household, there are still essential workers moving around. So the transmission doesn't go to zero. Lockdowns don't stop transmission. What they do is they suppress transmission to what governments hope is a manageable level. That's why some governments call these circuit breakers, as if they're trying to break the circuit, break the <clears throat> all the chains of transmission at the same time, rather than individual chains of transmission, um, which we do through contact tracing. Uh, so in that sense, it usually requires uh, you know, well, if you if you do it for two weeks, you potentially interrupt two generations of transmission. If you do it for three weeks, more. Most lo most governments who are putting lockdowns in place now are really considering four to six weeks at a sort of a minimum to get the maximum impact, but at the same time not shutting down for so long that the economy is permanently affected. But again, that's not a that's not it's not all driven by science. It's a trade-off between 
scientifically what will work and economically how much we can take. Uh, and that, in that sense, it's always that trade-off. And it's really important for us to understand that uh, because you wonder sometimes, well, why has one country got five weeks and the other country has six weeks? Well, it may not be a calculation about the virus. It may be an actual calculation about the economy or the tolerance of the people, or there are many other factors people have to take into account. But I would expect, and I, I don't have the numbers here, but for Europe you're probably going to see uh, highly restrictive measures for four to six weeks at least. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, here is uh, an interesting question about transmission. Uh, were there studies done on the rate of transmission of COVID-19 when using mass public transport? Uh, will the WHO eventually contribute to guidelines or protocols yet to be published on, um, on, public on transmission in public transport? Mm -hmm. Yes, so we do have guidance out on the use of masks um, and what we recommend is for the use of masks when you cannot do physical distancing. In particular, one is a good example is public transportation. So um, what we say is when you cannot do physical distancing or when physical distancing can't be maintained. So if you're in a situation where it can get quite crowded uh, and you don't want to be putting on and, you know, and taking off because there's also a risk when you're putting on and taking off your mask a lot of actually infecting yourself. You know, if you're not cleaning your hands appropriately before you put it on, uh, touching the outside, touching the inside, you know, touching your nose and your mouth, there's a lot of opportunities where you can almost infect yourself if the virus is, is actually on your hands. So one of the ways, especially in areas where you have... Um, active transmission, we call it community transmission, uh, wearing a mask on public transportation is important. But we're always looking at our guidance. We're always looking at updating our guidance, and we are actually always in a process of updating our guidance. Um, we have hundreds of guidance materials online right now, and all of them, um, without fail, um, are actually being looked at um, as we look at the, the different literature. There's a lot of studies that are out looking at the use of masks, um, and with this pandemic, we've seen a uh, uh, quite an increase in the use uh, in the use of these types of studies. We call these observational studies or ecological studies that are being conducted, um, and they're helping us understand uh, when and where and how they're used and, and how helpful they can be. Um, some of the challenges of them, there's always these limitations of the studies themselves are not perfect, um, but they are helpful in, in letting us see how the use of masks in the real world um, can can be part of a comprehensive package. But one of the challenges in studying the use of masks is not just do people wear masks or not, it's do they wear them appropriately. Um, because if you're wearing a mask and you have your nose, you know, I have my mask here. If I'm wearing my, my mask down here, if I'm wearing it down here, if I'm touching the inside, I'm touching the outside, I'm not wearing it appropriately. Um, but even when you're wearing a mask, you should still try to do physical distancing as much as you can because it isn't one measure alone uh, that's going to protect you or protect others. I think that's the key issue in, in this. Masks are really, <coughs> really helpful, really useful. And I think are useful, and you know, the science will say <coughs> they're very much uh, protect. If someone is symptomatic, mm -hmm. they certainly stop that person sp uh, spreading droplets all over the place. Mm -hmm. uh, as a barrier to your face, they, they certainly stop at least a proportion of particles mm -hmm hitting your face or going into your nose. There's no question they reduce risk of either exposing others or being exposed yourself. The other thing uh, they may do, and I think there's some evidence to suggest this, they may reduce the dose at which you're exposed. They may reduce the absolute number of viruses that get in, which may actually have an impact on the severity of the disease. We know that uh, dose exposure, in other words, the infectious dose, the amount of virus you're first infected with in many uh, infections, is um, affects how severely ill you can get with many infectious diseases. We're not 100% sure with coronavirus, but it would appear that your infectious dose will uh, affect the uh, severity of disease. Uh, so therefore, the less virus you're exposed to, even if you then become infected, you may be less sick. So there, there is every reason to wear a mask. But the one thing, and I've noticed this myself, and I've seen this myself, I've experienced this myself, and I have to force myself all the time to remember that when you put a mask on, it doesn't give you permission to close the physical distance. That's the problem at the moment, is people are wearing masks and then saying, and I can sit in somebody's, uh, uh, I can sit next, to, so if we had masks on, we could sit beside each other for this session. We're sitting at a physical distance, we wore our masks in here, we wear our masks in our common areas, 
here in this situation, we're in a well-ventilated room. I can hear the external air conditioning. We're, we're separated by the appropriate distance. I can safely take uh, my mask off me in this situation. There's no zero risk, but uh, it allows us to communicate for this time. But as soon as we leave here, we'll put our masks back on. We use the mask as a way of reducing risk, not going to zero, mm -hmm. but equally, if I have my mask on me and I go out in the corridor and I meet a colleague on the corridor, I will not go over and shake their hands. I will not go over and go very close. I will not give them a hug. I will not do the normal French greetings. You know, I, I re maintain that distance. And, and it's amazing, when, I, when we started using the mask here, I, I found it quite hard myself not to be over reassured by the mask and then say everything else is possible. Mm -hmm. And the same with washing hands, uh, before and after. <clears throat> I don't think we should forget. <laughs> anyway, there's no harm doing it. But hand hygiene is good for everyone, for everything. And, and, and being able to make sure that you put the mask on with clean hands and you take the mask off with clean hands. I don't know, I don't care how you get them clean. It's soap and water. It's using a sanitizer. But putting your hands up to your face and putting your hands down from your face. And as Maria said, sometimes it's an issue of practicality. I'm not calculating, oh, now I can take my mask off because I'm in the right environment. Sometimes I leave my mask on me even though... I don't need to. I'm walking down a corridor by myself. Sometimes when I get out of a, an Uber taxi here in Geneva, I have about 100 metres to walk to the building. Mm -hmm. um, after that, and it's mask wearing once we get in the building, I don't take my mask off when I get out of the Uber. Even though I'm standing in, 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 in the open air, because to take the mask off with my bag on, I've now got to take my hands that have been touching the taxi, put my hands up to my face, take my mask off, carry my mask down to, to the door of WHO, and then put the mask back on with my dirty hands. So what I do is I don't put my hands on anything, I don't touch my mask, I come to the front door of the building, and there's a sanitizer at the door of the building, and I sanitize my hands, and then I can, I can proceed. And, I, and, and, and it's, you know, for me, that's the thing. I've had to learn these things, these little techniques, the little behaviors that keep you safe. And, and there's no manual for this as such. It's about, a, I think you were talking about before, planning your day, yeah. planning your actions and saying, do I need to be here? Now, what's the best way for me to go from here to here? Should I be wearing a mask? Well, I'll put the mask on for the whole journey. There's no point. I'll just put the mask on and I'll do my walk and, my, and I'll do my public transport and I'll wait until I get the, to the house of my friend until I'm inside and when I'm sitting at the appropriate distance I'll take my mask off. We should be planning like that uh, and using masks as the tools they're intended to be and like any tool it's not perfect but it really helps and it will protect people in most situations from being exposed to the kind of larger doses that they could be exposed to. So I can't overemphasize the use of masks uh, more, but I would hope that people will not forget to do the other things. Thank you, Mike. I think here's a follow-up question for you, because you, 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 you said it several weeks ago, how you use public transport. Mm -hmm. and, and the viewer on LinkedIn is asking, is your team, are you or your team traveling in public uh, planes or trains so maybe you can share, share your everyday experience yeah no I do um, I occasionally uh, use uh, taxis uh, but most of the time I'm using public transport and again uh, it's hand washing it's it's my ma it's using masks and uh, you know I choose that I can sometimes in the evenings I can it's quite a distance but I can walk but sometimes I'm in a rush and I need to take the bus. But certainly from the bus journeys, the buses are very well managed here in, in Geneva and they have the appropriate seating and, uh, and everything else. And, uh, but I will, uh, many times, if it's real rush hour, uh, I'll choose to take a cab because that's one person with me and that costs me. The company doesn't pay for that. But I have to make a choice and say, I've got my travel card, but that bus is very full and the next bus is very full and the buses aren't going to be empty for a while. So then I go and get a taxi. I make that choice. It costs me money, but I prefer to make that choice. Uh, similarly, I'll let a, sometimes let a, two buses go by until I see a bus that's half empty, and I'll get on that bus and use that bus. And then I'll choose a place on the bus that's the maximum distance away from the other people. Um, uh, open a window if the window can be opened. And again, hand sanitizing. So it's a matter, again, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, choosing that. I mean, obviously, I could come to work in a car. I choose to come to work in public transport because I believe there is a safe way to use public transport. It is a partnership between me and the public transport company and the government. 
They put in place rules, the company implements the rules. I am my own risk manager. My risk is not zero, but I'm comfortable with that risk because I trust that the company have done everything, the government are doing what they, and I need to do something to make myself safe. And I feel reasonably comfortable in that situation. But as I said, many times I let the tram by or let the bus by because I take a look and I say, I can be 10 minutes late. About the be your own risk manager, a lot of what we've been trying to get people to think about is their own individual day, their own individual context, and what they can do. And it's it's about taking the steps that minimizes your opportunity for exposure, the opportunity for this virus to infect you. Um, and it's a lot of little decisions all day. So it's not one thing. I mean, you keep hearing us say do it all, but it's it's so many individual decisions that carry out through your entire day. Um, and I think what everyone has to do when I was saying make a plan is to add this as part of your decision making. It has to be part of your decision making. Um, and there's a lot that you can do. So I mean, some of these are really, uh, really simple things, like if you can walk to work. I mean, many people live in cities and they can walk to work. Um, if you can work from home, I mean, some of those decisions. And we have many people here uh, in our offices here that are teleworking. Um, and we're, you know, into the 11th month of this pandemic, and it was quite an adjustment for, for many, many, but we're, we're, we're figuring it out. So in many situations where they're having intense transmission, if you, can, if you can work from home and you're supported to work from home, work from home. I mean, that helps, you know, and it helps reduce those that need to be on public transport. Um, it could be riding your bike instead of, you know, taking public transportation. But uh, we are very fortunate that we live in, in situations where it is supported, as Mike has said. But that's not true all over the world. Yeah, and so we have to recognize that. Um, and not everybody can walk to work, you know, not everybody. So there's a lot of individual decisions that, that people need to make. But I do think that there are other ways, uh, families, uh, parents, communities can help. And a lot of this is about taking decisions about minimizing contact with other families. Um, it means taking really tough decisions, you know, of not having that birthday party. I think I told you uh, we're not having a birthday party for my son this year. And he already knows that, so I'm not surprising him. Um, but these, we've decided to have a Zoom dance party birthday, you know, um, with his friends who he grew up with in London. And when this is over, we're going to have one heck of a good birthday party. But these are decisions that we have to make. And it's no play dates right now, and it's no sleepovers. And that's tough for little kids. But these are decisions as mom, as a mom, and my husband and I, we've decided. But we feel that this is a way that we can contribute. And I think that everyone needs to think about how do I... How do I reduce the chance for me getting infected? But how do I also reduce the opportunity for this virus to spread? Um, the virus, we talk a lot about transmission. And we talk a lot about the context in which transmission can happen more often. You know, where is spread amplified? And spread is amplified when you have people who are in close contact with, it, with each other for long periods of time. And in particular, when you're in indoor spaces where there's poor ventilation. That's like the trifecta. You know, if you have all of those situations in place, um, lots of people, long periods of time, close contact, poor ventilation, the virus will spread. And the virus spreads because it spreads between people. This is a respiratory virus. You've heard us say that from the beginning. And that means it spreads through these particles, through the air, from me to you. Mm -hmm. And if I am in close contact with you or with Mike, the opportunity is higher when we spend, and if I'm infected, and especially if I'm symptomatic, I have more virus. And if I'm sneezing and if I'm coughing, I'm expelling these particles um, through the air. And that is, uh, we want to reduce that opportunity. And so I think, you know, the ways in which we take decisions to minimize that by not going into that enclosed space, if I can, if we can, please do that, because that will really minimize the chances of, of the virus spreading. Thank you very much. I, mean, I think it's really a really important point there in terms of, you know, uh, we talk about routes of transmission and how the virus is transmitted and th that this respiratory route, the fact that the, the virus can spread through the air by different size of droplets. And it's essentially, if you cough or you sneeze, you produce these small, they're very small. They're when we talk small. droplets, they're, they're not, small. you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, they're all small, but yeah. it's relative. And, and in some senses, it makes sense to people, uh, you know, a large droplet will fall to the floor 
more quickly and, uh, and, and smaller uh, aerosols or smaller particles can, can travel further. It's the same thing if you throw a water bag in the air, the smaller particles go further and the, uh, the, 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 big, uh, the big droplets fall back down on top of you. So the reality is that this transmission through the air occurs in environments where the closer you are to someone, the longer you're in that environment with someone, the more poorly ventilated that situation is. If you don't have a mask on you at the time, and if the person with you doesn't have a mask on, what you're actually doing is creating an environment in which all the forms of transmission, the touch form the transmission, the contamination of surfaces, the respiratory spread, the large droplets, the small droplets, what in effect happens is you get a perfect storm. So if I'm sitting in an overcrowded nightclub where everyone is singing and producing particles and there's a couple of infect, uh, uh, there's a couple of uh, symptomatic people there sneezing, nobody's wearing masks, there's no ventilation and everyone's singing and you're there for hours and you're packed in closely together, the problem is not the route of transmission. The problem is the place you are, the context you're in. Uh, people aren't uh, uh, super scientists. You can't look, you haven't got some kind of radar that says, you know, super radar, my super skill is I can detect particles in the air or I can see the virus on the surface. You can't. All you know as a human being in the real world is this situation is dangerous for me. Mm -hmm. That's what you know. So that's what you can manage. This situation is risky for me. I am inside, I'm in a poorly ventilated place, people are too closely packed together, nobody's wearing a mask, and everyone's engaged in behavior that I can see is generating these particles. That's a situation you just don't want to be in. You don't sit there and debate. I wonder what size of particles are spreading the disease here, and I wonder if the surfaces are contributing more to transmission in here. In that context, that's not what matters. What matters is the situation you're in, you don't need to be in. If you have to be there, be there for the shortest possible time that you can be there uh, and get the hell out of Dodge as quickly as you can. That's the right decision to make. So we need to separate what is a healthy and important scientific debate around how disease transmits. That's important. That's what the scientists do. From what people need to do. And what people need to do is understand that the context in which transmission occurs uh, is these more enclosed spaces, poorly ventilated spaces, too many people close together carrying out activities that generate droplets and that generate aerosols. And in that situation, you want to be there for the shortest possible time. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of, the again, that little animated video that the, you the showed me today. Yeah, so we have a video <laughs> it's really cool. Maybe we can drop it in the... the, the um Mm, sorry, the chat thing in the below. Mm -hmm. I'm so not cool on, on uh, mm -hmm. Facebook. Whatever that is, if we put the, the link, then you can see the video, which mm -hmm. talks about You're the... Okay. <laughs> sorry, guys. My kids call me the, uh, um, <laughs> I, so that, cool. This is one I would like to redo. <laughs> uh, if we could put that video in the, in the link, that would be helpful. But I think this, th what we're trying to describe here is that you know, um, there, are different, there are so many different modes of transmission that WHO is looking at. And... USCDC and ECDC and everyone, you know, in fact, every government is looking at this and we want to know, you know, how do we protect people because that's what matters is how, how we protect people. And so as a respiratory virus, you know, it does pass through these particles and uh, you've seen me describe it in, in, in different sizes, you know, the droplets fall quicker and then the smaller ones can remain suspended for a little bit longer. Um, and that's what's important. If we provide that opportunity for those droplets, those aerosols to stay in, in suspended longer, and the longer that you're in that room, you can have these aerosol transmission. Um, and it's, almost, it's opportunistically airborne because we've created the situation that's allowing it to remain suspended in the air, and we're allowing that virus to stay present so people can get infected. And so what matters is what we do. And we are um, very strong in all of the different ways that we talk about preventing transmission. So first of all, as Mike said, avoiding these three C's that we talk a lot about, these crowded spaces, close contact settings, um, you know, where you spend long periods of time uh, is one. And if you can't, make sure that you have a mask in that situation, in that area, and improve your ventilation. Open a window. You know, make sure you increase the amount of fresh air that's coming into that, into that um, setting. 
um, because there's a lot that you can do to, to prevent that. So uh, it, thanks for letting us go through that a little bit. But it, the context and the setting is so, so very important. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Vlad, because there was a question that I was about to ask, but I think you already addressed it, is about super spreading events and if WHO is looking at these and what is our recommendation. But I think you very well explained how in these yes. crowded places and uh, the virus can also yes, but also the the super spreading events is not necessarily linked to aerosol transmission. There is a component of that, but the super spreading events are situations in with in which um, an individual. So I think you've heard us say that not everybody transmits the virus to someone else. There are some individuals. It's been estimated that between ten and twenty percent of cases are responsible for about eighty percent of transmission events, and so. Where are those settings, and why is that happening, and what is the context in which that is happening? Some of that is these is these closed settings. Um, absolutely, most of it is in these enclosed settings where people spend long periods of time, uh, where there are multiple modes of transmission that are occurring. But there are also other types of situations like long-term living facilities where we've seen spread um, happen. We've seen spread in prisons. Um, We've seen spread in certain types of occupations, um, in expat dormitories. So there are other types of super spreading events. Super spreading is a hallmark of coronaviruses. In fact, one of the first things I warned about in January was around this idea of super spreading, which we were worried about in health facilities. Mm -hmm. um, because when someone enters into a health facility and it's a new virus, um, and it's a respiratory virus, you can't tell if somebody has um, this new virus, this COVID-19, or if it's the common cold, or if it's, what is it? And it could spread like wildfire if people don't have the right types of precautions in place. Um, and we do have very good data from clinical studies um, showing that health workers, if they're wearing what we call droplet and contact precaution, this is a medical mask, it's eye protection, it's gloves, and it's a gown, that they can be protected from infection. And that's really, really critical because even if there is all this debate, even if we don't know everything, there's a lot that we know about how to protect health workers and there's a lot that we know about how to protect individuals. And I don't want anyone watching this to be concerned that because scientists are having debates, which we do, um, that the guidance is wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, we are challenging each other all the time and that is good. And even, even the, the, the significant debates that we have on certain topics, we look at that guidance. And we are consistent in our guidance and our messaging across the international agencies and the national agencies. Um, and what we are putting out is what will protect people. So don't be concerned about that from, you know, from an individual point of view. You have to do it all, though. You can't just wear a mask alone. You can't just wash your hands. No one measure is more important than another. You know, we, can't, we have to get away from that. Physical distancing is critical. Yeah. Um, physical distancing is actually where we have more evidence than some of these other measures. Yeah. Okay. Because physical distancing of at least one meter, I say at least one meter, the further the distance, the better. Yeah. Outdoors are better than indoors. Masks is better than no mask. So there's a lot that has to be done. And it's that combination of factors. You know, take it into your own hands. Be your own superhero. Protect yourself. Yeah, and I think the, the, the three words... I was trying to think of the words because I'm obviously very hard to educate. So the video, I didn't watch it enough times, but I really liked, you know, the the idea. And when we'd spoken about this before, um, actually, we spoke about this in one of our first Facebooks yep. about uh, um, uh, location, proximity, and time. Mm -hmm. And we can every individual can do that. Where am I going? Mm -hmm. How long am I going to be there? And how close am I going to be to others? If you can determine that for every thing you do in your day, and there are some things you just can't avoid doing, you need to go to the shops. Yep. And there's a calculated risk in doing that, and you have to, you've got to feed your kids. So you accept that as a slightly risky thing to do, but then you avoid doing something else, like meeting your friend for a, for a, for a coffee. So, and I think that's the only way we're going to beat this virus. And let me be you know, honest and frank with everyone. We have to find a way of behaving and living with the virus by suppressing it at the same time. The way we, I mean, it's not that living a normal life <clears throat> um, is, is impossible. We can live our lives in a way that minimize the opportunity for the virus to spread. And in doing that, we can possibly avoid lockdowns entirely.
that, and if we then cooperate with public health authorities when a case is detected, so let's say I'm really managing my risk and I'm looking at my location, my proximity, my time, I'm listening to what's going on and I'm trying to apply all the best measures, I'm taking occasional risk because I have to, I have to get to work so I have to use the bus, I have to feed my kids so I have to go to the shop, but that's what I do and otherwise I'm going to minimize my risk to, a, to a zero. Now if I get a phone call to say, uh, Mr. Ryan, you've been detected as a positive case, that's going to turn my life upside down. I've got to completely adjust in seconds uh, to what's going to, going to happen. It happened to be a mother of kids, and I'm thinking, oh my God, I can't go to work. Going, what about my kids? Have I infected my kids? What's going to happen now? People's lives get turned upside down by this. They need support at that moment, right? And then when I get a call, or my friend gets a call to say, you're a contact of a case, now my life gets turned upside down, because I'm not even sick. I don't get the sympathy of being unwell, right? <laughs> I'm a contact and I get put home for 14 days on my job and you know my last appraisal was awful and now they're going to think I'm at home and do I need to prove I'm a contact? How, one person asked me how do I prove I'm a contact because my boss won't believe me. <laughs> you know, I mean they're the things that go through people's minds and they're very, very understandable. So what we need to be able to do is we can avoid, and I'll say this, we need to learn this time that I believe and as other countries have shown we can avoid uh, the, the worst of lockdowns if we can find a way that we as individuals and communities can minimize the opportunities for this virus to transmit and that our government authorities can put in place the necessary testing and tracing and supports to help us when we're a case or when we're a contact. And I honestly don't think we've got there yet. And Maria called for a scale-up. We need a scale-up in all of that. Now, I'm not trying to criticize anyone. Everyone went through horrors of the spring. Everyone was exhausted. Everyone kind of took a breather in the summer and said, oh, you know, okay, maybe we're through the worst of this and let's come back, right? Now, we're taken by surprise the first time, maybe slightly by surprise the second time. Let's not get taken by surprise the third time. Uh, so we can, we need to take the medicine we have to take now as a society, unfortunately, but we really need to think about can we do this better the next time? Can we find a way of living, not in harmony with this virus, but living with this virus in a way that we keep it under, under control? Because right now, the virus has us under control and not the other way around. Thank you, Mike. I think at the, at the beginning, we, we promised our viewers that we will touch on contact tracing and quarantine, and I'm glad you, you, you brought it in. Mm -hmm. um, so let's, let's say if we, if, if we take one of those uh, super spreading events or crowded places where people go and they are identified, like they test positive, mm -hmm. um, is it possible then to trace all the contacts if the person used the public transport and went to the mm -hmm. shop before they went home or maybe they picked the, the kid from the school? So they, there may be hundreds of people that one person was in touch. Mm -hmm. So how do we make possible then that we trace all contacts? Um, how are countries coping with this? It's tough. I've been in Ebola outbreaks where the number of contacts for one case was 1,100 once. Mm -hmm. 1,100. Mm -hmm. Because everyone attended the funeral of a very well-known person and, and the tradition was to touch the body in respect. So we had 1,100 contacts. Uh, and I've seen other situations where you had one contact, someone living at home with their, their partner. Mm -hmm. So that number can increase or decrease. There's a difference and this is how public health authorities will do it. They'll identify everyone by a definition. Usually it's someone who spent more than 15 minutes in the sense, again, that's arbitrary. W what if I spend 14 minutes or 16 minutes? These are cutoffs. They're used to create some sort of sense of risk. But let's imagine we say more than 15 minutes and it turns out the person is in a nightclub and there's 500 people in it, right? Then the authorities are going to have to try and get a list of 500 people. But within that, they're going to look who was in the party with the person, who was sitting at the same table, who served them at the bar, you know, um, uh, did they do the karaoke and who was on the stage with them, they'll, they'll try, and, they'll try and, 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 and create a list of what they consider to be higher risk contact or highest risk, medium risk and low risk contacts and they'll prioritize following up with those people who they believe were most exposed, right? And, and then there'll be some people who are at the bar they'll never be able to contact and we saw that in Korea. The issue, and, and sometimes I find in, in this pandemic, there seems to be a strange thing at times, that if we can't do it perfectly, we don't do it at all. Well, unfortunately, in public health, most things aren't perfect. 
Uh, but the idea, you know, I have one, someone said to me, well, you know, this symptomatic and asymptomatic uh, cases, but, you know, why are you trying to test or, to, you know, you're, you're, you're going to isolate symptomatic cases, but there's so many asymptomatic cases, why are we even bothering? And I'm going, yeah, it's really tough, and it's really tough that so many cases are asymptomatic, but you're not suggesting that we don't try to isolate the symptomatic cases, uh, and that was the sort of the, 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 the implication. You do what you can. You work with what you can see. So in this case, for a, an event like that with lots of contacts, you will prioritize the follow-up of the people you believe to be most at risk. There will be some people you never find. And some of those people, and unfortunately what happens, and we've seen the same in Ebola and other diseases, those lower-risk contacts may turn in, and we know in, in most super-spreading or most clusters, not super-spreading events, that about 20% uh, of people can retransmit, and about 80% of people never transmit to anybody else. So there are particular individuals or particular people who may be more prone to spread because of their behaviours or because of their symptoms, or we, we don't fully understand that, I don't think. We don't understand that. But certainly it's not everybody has the same chance of transmitting afterwards. Certain people will, will transmit more. And if in those situations a low-risk contact gets sick and and then they begin transmitting. What you hope is you pick them up in the next generation. Remember what I said, there's about a week between generations. And it's a real tragedy not to find all of the at-risk people, but you do accept. We see the same thing in Ebola, and that's the, the horrors of, you know, why we had to spend so much time in Congo, because, you know, why you spend so much time in an Ebola outbreak stop, if you could find every case of this generation in Ebola, and you could isolate every contact, most Ebola outbreaks will be over in 21 days. Why do they go on for a year? They go on for a year because we miss a small proportion of people in every generation. And we hope we pick them in the next. And eventually it takes us, and it took us in Congo, in the last outbreak in, in Kivu, it took us basically a year to catch up with ourselves because we were in a conflict zone and our contact tracing wasn't as efficient as it could have been. And the population was, was, was very distrustful of... of, of um, of, of everybody because of the conflict and because of the, um, the uh, armed groups and everything else. So we were operating in a less than efficient environment. It's exactly the same now. Contact tracing, isolation and quarantine are not perfect. Not every case is found. Not every contact is found. It is our belief that if you can find the majority of your cases, the majority of your contacts, and if you keep doing that generation after generation, you get control. That's what Korea showed. That's what Japan showed. That is what China has showed. That is what the health authorities in Hong Kong and in Macau and in Taiwan have showed. That is what Australia showed. I mean, Australia deserves huge credit because Australia was facing a really difficult situation in, in Victoria in particular. They had a real, they got caught behind, there was, uh, they had cases. Um, they went into a 101 day lockdown. Uh, you know, I can't imagine trying to lock down Australians for 101 days. Very independent and proud people. But the sense of, achievement that I feel coming from from Australia the fact and what I what I really I saw the morning after the lockdown a, a prominent person from Sydney actually thanking the people of Melbourne for protecting Sydney and I thought to myself that's real solidarity people are starting to get it it's not only for the other person it's for the other state and the other community the other parish the other district you're doing this not only on your own behalf, not only on behalf of your own community or your own family, you do it on behalf of the, the other state. Um, and, and to see the way Australia pushed, pulled together that, and there was resistance, and at the beginning of those measures in, in Victoria, there were lots of questions asked about, oh, this is draconian, and this is... But they also, at the same time, put in place contact tracing. Uh, they put in place all kinds of supports, and they built a system that's proven very effective. Now, that doesn't mean Australia is completely out of the woods, but I think Australia has demonstrated that uh, there is a point in any crisis where you have to turn and face the fire. You have, and that's us. Korea had that moment when it had the outbreaks in the religious communities and the cases exploded. And Korea could have said, oh, there's nothing we can do now. Uh, they didn't. They turned and they faced the fire, and there was very hard work to, 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 to get on top of things. And even when you're on top of things, you're just about on top of things with this virus. You're never fully on top of things. So I think we need to, and someone asked before about learning lessons. It's not about learning lessons so we can criticize the government of the day. Everyone is in the situation they're in. 
Everyone is working as hard as they can work, right? And I do, I honestly believe that. Uh, the, but everyone needs to look and look at Australia and say, okay, because you could look at a country and say, well, that's not the context we live in. That's not our culture. That's that will be very hard to. Imply. And I can see that you could look at a country and say, that's not going to work here. So there's enough countries now with experience that we need to start looking at the ones most like us, or the ones where we can find those lessons that are applicable in our socio-cultural, economic, and political context. And are we learning? And even within our own countries, you'll find there are areas. I mean, it's amazing. In every country, you find the outlier area that's, that's done really well, and everyone is going, How have they, what, what did they do? <laughs> you know, you, I, I, and, and I think we need to also not look outside, look inside for those examples. Um, uh, and within that, uh, you know, and it is, it is very, very tough. And, and, and at this moment, it's really important that at the political side of things, that this doesn't turn at national level into, you know, a political football at national level, where this turns into an issue of just criticizing the other side. So, anything, you know, so governments are making some very tough decisions right now. And it is hard. It is really hard to make. And they do, they do need to be accountable, as we need to be accountable for those decisions. They need to be rational. They need to be science and evidence-based. They need to be uh, of minimum impact on, on social and economic life. They need to be of limited duration. There needs to be a way out. All of those things. But within that, if governments are trying to do that, we need to, tr we need to get behind those governments and try and support those measures, whatever they are. But at the same time, keep everybody accountable. But I've seen in some countries it's really turned into a, a kind of a political issue. Um, and, and I don't think that's necessarily helping right now. Yeah. Can, I, can I give one practical example of a contact, tr contact tracing? Because if the viewers are out there and there's somebody who is infected with this virus, they can help in, the, in, in doing contact tracing. So what normally happens is that there will be an authority that will call you and say, you know, you've been identified as a case and, and we need to identify your contacts so that we can, we can do. But what you can do as an individual, there's, there's forward contact tracing and then there's what we call backward contact tracing. Most of what is happening in many situations is what we call forward contact tracing because you want to prevent the virus from spreading onwards, so to keep passing from person to person to person. So if an individual is um, identified as a case, what you would need to do is you would need to write down and you would need to think of all of the people that you came in contact with um, just before you develop symptoms, two days before you develop symptoms, up to what the point where you were isolated. And it's an exercise, and it's actually quite hard to do. I mean, you should think about who you've come in contact with and you know, pick a, pick a period of time. Write down those names and the nature in which you, you came in contact with, and, and, and um, those individuals need to be called. Someone, um, a health authority, should contact those individuals. And if not, you can, and say, I've been infected as a case. I think you are a contact. You, know, you need to go into quarantine. It isn't necessarily your responsibility, but you can help with this because time matters. The, you know, the second that you know you care for yours, you know, make sure that you get the clinical care that you need, but then make that list. But what we also do is we also look backwards and say, you know, what did I, if I were the case, what did I do in the 14 days before I got sick? Where was I? Did I go to a nightclub? Did I go to a party? Uh, did I go to a certain event. What did I do? Did I go to work? Did I travel? Did I, what did I do in that 14 days? And then you try to figure out how did, what is the source of my infection? And sometimes that leads you to an event. And then whatever that event is, contact tracing happens there as well. So if it were the bar that I went to and I had uh, went to that nightclub, Mike always uses the nightclub example. If we go to that oh, nightclub, no I don't know why, Mike. Um, but um, if we go to that nightclub example, then, then contact tracing needs to happen there or a cluster investigation needs to happen there. So there is a difference between individual contact tracing and making sure that I find those individuals so I prevent the onward spread. But there's also looking backwards to think of where did I get infected and is there transmission happening there? Because there's more public health action that has to happen there as well. So as individuals, those people who are watching, there's something that you can do. Um, and I, I was going to ask you, Alex, I think you asked, uh, there's a hashtag of something around. So yes, we, what, the, the, what we asked yeah. our, our followers is um, uh, to share their stories if they, if they were in quarantine or yeah. if they supported someone in quarantine. So I also wanted to clarify, um, as a 
if, if we are identified as a contact, then we need to quarantine for 14 days. Yes. Um, there were some questions coming that WHO recommends quarantine for 14 days, but some countries recommend 10 or 7 days. So how did we come up with the recommendation of 14 days and why some countries are um, recommending less? So 14 days is based on what we know about the incubation period, which is the point of exposure to the time that you develop symptoms. Uh, and the range of the incubation period is from around 1 to 14 days. There are some outliers that, that suggest it might be a little bit longer, but that's what we see. But most people will develop symptoms between 5 and 6 days after their exposure. Um, when we say the quarantine of 14 days, that, that, that will keep someone... Um, uh, away from other individuals, and again, people need to be supported in that quarantine. Um, in that 14 days, if they can stay in quarantine there and they don't develop symptoms, they don't uh, develop disease, um, they won't pass that virus on to someone else after that 14 days. Now, there are basically the 14 days is around 95%. It's, I don't want to get too too technically technical, but it's about the ninety. It's the ninety fifth percentile. So there may be a five percent of individuals who will develop symptoms after that fourteen day period. Um, some countries have decided to reduce the quarantine day period to ten days or to seven days, and some of them have also introduced a test. So if a, someone is in quarantine and they reduce quarantine period to ten days, some of them require a test at day ten, or some of them request a test at day seven. Um, any change in that quarantine period, there's some benefits, there's some risks associated with that. Um, and I think what countries are doing, they're weighing those risks and benefits. Uh, if you reduce the quarantine day period from 14 days to 10 days, for example, you will miss about 13% of cases who will go on to develop symptoms after that 10-day period. Um, and I think what countries are trying to do is balance the economic risks and the social risks with the public health risks. So WHO's recommendation is for 14 days um, because that's what's based on the incubation period. Um, but we have supported governments in taking decisions about if they were to reduce it, adding a test or not. But what are the risks you are adding if you do reduce that quarantine day period? Mm. And it's a risk-benefit analysis. Remember what I said before. <clears throat> we don't always identify all the contacts. So there are always potentially, in, and always is, uh, with these kind of more clusters and super spreading events, there are, there are nearly always people we don't identify, and they could be spreading the disease. Mm -hmm. So the contacts we do identify, we're asked, they're asked to, to self-quarantine for, for 14 days. If they self-quarantine for 10 days, then clearly we're taking most of the risk of them being the next case away, because they, they should. And, and uh, about what, about 90% or more of them will develop the disease. About 87%. Yeah, you know, 87%, yeah, yeah. yeah within, <laughs> within that 10 days. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, letting that person back into society is much less risky, but it's not without some risk. Mm -hmm. it's, and, and that's life, unfortunately, yeah. because governments feel that the benefit of that economically, and the other issue <clears throat> would be compliance. Because if I have to quarantine for 10 days, maybe I'll really work hard at doing it and I won't sneak out and go and see my friends for a beer. Whereas 14 days might be too much psychologically and I, and I, and I don't take it as seriously. So governments are trying to not only match the, the, the issue of um, how long, but how long will people comply? Uh, and therefore, I'd rather have a 10-day regime in which people are supported and in which everybody complies. And I know then I'm going to miss a small percentage of cases, but I accept that because everybody who's in that 10-day period is really, really playing by the rules. And you're going to stop a lot of transmission that way. And that's the trade-off. Um, so 14, 10, uh, in ideal situation, you identify all the, all the contacts and all the contacts quarantine for 14 days. Uh, that's also a, an issue too, uh, and again, Maria referred to this, and I was glad she did earlier, because we're talking here in terms that are very, <clears throat> right now, and, and it's not where I've worked most of my career, northern-oriented, northern-world-oriented. I mean, if you're a day worker, mm -hmm. and if you're paid in cash by the day, uh, 14 days in quarantine is, is, is not only an extreme punishment for you as a person, but for your family. In most situations of, of, of poverty, that means people are not going to eat. Yes. Kids are not going to eat. 
So, you know, you, we need to be really careful when we apply these things. We're trying to get the best benefit in stopping the disease with the least impact on people's lives, livelihoods, uh, and especially on their kids. And these have to be carefully traded off. So the decision a government might make in India or a government might make in South Africa or a government might make in Congo may be very different to the decision that might be made in Denmark or made in my country, Ireland. And that doesn't make the decision in one country or the other the wrong decision. What we need to examine in those decisions is how did the government make the decision? How do they trade off the epidemiologic risk mm -hmm. with the social and economic risk? And was that a reasonable trade-off? And have they done that with best evidence and with best intent? And, and, and can they then manage the consequences of those decisions? So if I decide I'm really going to go after the virus and I'm going to lock down and I'm going to slam on the societal brakes, well, if I'm going to do that, <clears throat> am I going to be able to mitigate and manage the consequences of that socially in mental health and other terms, right? Mm -hmm. Or, on the other hand, if I'm going to let the virus let rip, and I'm really saying the virus is not you know, the main issue here, the economy is, and I'm going to not implement measures, am I prepared to manage the consequences of that, which are a whole lot of people arriving in hospitals and dying in an uncontrolled epidemic? And what most governments have come to a conclusion is we have to find a rational, sustainable balance between those two things, and most governments have recognized that there is no economic recovery without stopping the virus in some meaningful way. Um, and, and the two are not uh, trade-offs in their own right, that you need to s control the virus it's to some extent to bring your economy back on stream, but equally, you shouldn't put in place measures in controlling the virus that are going to entirely uh, impoverish your community uh, especially in developing countries, for example, where the average age may be below 60. If you look at Africa, t half the population is younger than 20. Uh, the proportion of people over 60 is very low. So a government in an African environment may make an entirely different decision around how it's going to both control and mitigate the virus than a government with a population where 20 or 30 percent of people are over 65, which is the case in many northern countries. So I, I think um, if the one message I want to get across in this pandemic is there are no absolute decisions. Every decision you make as an individual and a government makes for a population are contextual. They're based on where you are, what your situation is, what the consequences of your decisions are, and you put those things together and you come up with a plan. Governments that have had a clear plan well communicated to their population, regardless of its objectives, have tended to do better. Where people have become confused with the objective and the plan, and where governments haven't been able to support people in implementing the plan, I think we've seen more frustration, and we've seen people just really lash out and say, what the hell? I mean, who's in, who's in control here? Who's managing this? Uh, who's driving this bus? And I think that's where people get really, really upset. And you know what we're trying to get to is the situation where we can have well-conducted, supported quarantine for those who need it, as opposed to quarantining the entire population. Because that is essentially what these lockdowns are. Mm -hmm. You are quarantining the entire population because we don't know where the virus is and because we don't know who the cases and contacts are. So what we see in many countries across Asia and the Pacific is that they've gotten transmission down to a low level. And what they can do is they can do contact tracing thoroughly, adequately, support people who are in, quant in quarantine so that others can be out and about. And, and that's what we need to get to. And the reason we keep pushing these public health measures is because we've seen countries use these tools and get to that. We need them to stay in that low level of transmission and not have a resurgence because resurgences are not, um, they don't have to happen. So I'll say again, I mean, what we want is supported quarantine for those who should be in quarantine so that we don't have to quarantine the entire population. Thank you, Bob. I think we are over time today. I think, um, Maria, what you just said about support for people who need to be in quarantine is something that we realized from the stories that, that followers mm -hmm. have shared. 
Some of them expressed that they were very lonely. Some of them felt depressed. Mm -hmm. On the other side, some were using digital technologies to stay in touch with their families. Um, some were taking online classes or doing arts. But we know that it's not that everyone has that luxury. Yes. Um, so thank you very much for all the, the answers today. I, I thank all our viewers for great questions. We received some positive feedback and we also received some requests to focus one of our sessions on health workers in following weeks. Oh. So we'll, we'll look Good. into that. Good. Thank you for your suggestions. Um, keep them coming and please uh, until next week and every day please stay safe and follow our updated information on our social media channels and website. Thank you.